Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program was brought to you by Fiji Water and Patina Events at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, an idyllic location for weddings, corporate events, and parties of any style. Visit us at patinaevents.com. Hey, Food Radio listeners. I'm HRN's Executive Director, Katie, and I'm really excited to share that we're launching a brand new show. Meet and Three is HRN's weekly food news roundup. Tune in for a deep dive and three tasty shorts every Friday evening. It's 15 minutes, so you can listen while you wait for your pizza. This week, the fight for universal free lunch in New York City public schools isn't over yet. I'm overburdened. I'm overworked. I don't get staffed when people are out. Plus, Dana Cowan, former editor of Food & Wine magazine and host of HRN's Speaking Broadly, catches up with Valerie Lomas, the winner of the Great American Baking Show's Derailed Season 3. Discover how a Danish brewery is motivating people to get fit and hear Alison Roman speak to the highs and lows of her cookie recipe going viral. Every time I see anyone in a social setting, that's generally the first thing they ask me is, how are the cookies? Be better informed and wildly inspired by the stories and people you hear on Meet and 3. Find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to A Hungry Society. I'm Korsha Wilson, and this is the show where we talk about food, food media, and so much more. Today's guest is Alicia Kennedy, a Long Island-born, Brooklyn-based food writer who focuses on the intersection of food and politics, cocktails, vegan cuisine, and Puerto Rico. Alicia has written for The Village Voice, New York Times, The Guardian, Taste, Hazlitt, Nylon, wine enthusiast, and more. Uh, Recently, she co-organized the Food Writers Workshop, an inclusive and accessible conference to empower food media creators. Alicia, welcome to A Hungry Society. Thank you so much for having me, (laughs) Korsha. Thank you for coming. Um, So writing your bio was kind of hard because I feel like you do so much in, in the food world, not just food writing. How do you describe your work? Well, I, you know, I'm a food writer, and I think that that can encompass more than we allow it to. Um, and I definitely let it bleed into other things like organizing food right work, the food writer's workshop, <laughs> rather. I was calling it by its Instagram handle. Um, and, you know, I organized a fundraiser back in September of last year for, for Puerto Rican food service workers. And basically, like, food writing just influences everything that I do, and I, I try to make it more just more than sitting at a computer and talking to people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were catching up a bit before the show and the last time you were here was right after or you were on food without borders, another show on HRN. Um, and it was right after the fundraiser that you did for Puerto Rico, where you raised $10,000 yes. for food service workers on the island. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that event that you held? Oh, sure. Um, I tweeted that I was put in a Facebook group with a bunch of chefs and bartenders from the island because I've written a lot about the island, so I have a lot of connections there. And I tweeted it. Somehow Lynn manuel Miranda retweeted it. And then the woman who owns the Brooklyn Kitchen offered us her space. 
And then all of a sudden in a week, I was putting together a fundraiser and I flew up the chef Maria Grubb from, she was stranded in Miami. Mm. So I used my JetBlue points, flew her up (laughs) and uh, we got the green market to donate like tons of produce. We got lots of people donating so much stuff to us. Um, and so many people donated raffles and then, yeah, we sold out in three days and we ended up raising $10,000 despite the ticket price being only $25. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so cut forward to the food writers workshop, which kind of, um, it's not raising money, but it is kind of the same thing, like low cost of entry for food media creators. Right. Can you talk about like how that came about, how you created that? Yeah, it came about with Emily Stevenson and Layla Schlack, and we were just complaining about the high price of IACP, which is a cookbook professionals conference, but has kind of grown to encompass food media, and it it seemed to be one of the only spaces for everyone to come together. And it was just such a high cost, and I wasn't, I mean, I don't consider myself a person who wants to go to IACP, so for me, it was like, whatever. But (laughs) since so many people were upset, it was like, you know what, let's use our networks and use our, like, I, I do like to organize events. It's almost a hobby for me. Um, so we'll just use those capabilities and create the cheapest possible day of food conference, like panels that we can. And that's what we did. Uh, and it cost 1350 for each of the hundred tickets. And we sold out of that in less than 24 hours, like maybe 12 hours. It was ridiculous. Um, and yeah, it ended up being amazing. We paid for our lunch from Samosa Shack, but then we had breakfast donated by Bien Kui. We had coffee donated by Counterculture. Um, Monsoon Sweets gave us cupcakes for some reason. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it was great. And, um, yeah, it just ended up being a really great day. It yeah. was such a fun day. Um, as someone who has gone to a few conferences, um, it was incredibly useful as well. Like getting to hear, um, people that you know you read all the time and that you admire from afar like talk about the actual like logistics of how they do what they do every day right including the business of um, food writing right yeah and I feel like that's something that we need to talk about and that it I think going forward food the food writers workshop wants to be kind of a hub for for food writers and for, you know, podcasters and basically everyone in food media so that we can share resources and collaborate and basically kind of be not a union, but some sort of like <laughs> collective force that can try right. and make things better in, for all of us and make food media more interesting. Like if, if none of us are pitching boring stories, then maybe no one will write them anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you decide you wanted to become a food writer? Like what, how did that start? Well, I've always wanted to be a writer. So I went to college at Fordham and I majored in English, minored in philosophy and uh, ended up a copy editor at New York Magazine thinking that that was going to be a route to being a writer, and it was not. It was a route to copy editing. Um, And then while I was there, I just started baking a lot. I just had always loved baking and just started baking like uh, some sort of psychotic. Like it was in a very compulsive sort of thing that I was doing, probably just to do something with my hands. And uh, it ended up snowballing into like an actual bakery that I did. Like I I was in a commercial kitchen. I was selling at farmer's markets. And then that kind of blew up (laughs) with the end of a very long relationship. And then I moved to Brooklyn and was like, you know what, now I'm going to try to write about food. And uh, I had all these, all this kind of knowledge and some connections because I had been in the world of actually running a small business. And I, I came to it from that, from that perspective of being a woman small business owner. And so it's always been important to me to write those stories. And, and it just seemed to me that there were so many stories that weren't being written that I thought, well, why isn't anyone writing them? And then mm-hmm. I realized that it's mostly because the editors don't want them. <laughs> but <laughs> I found my way through, through, through that and uh, have been able to just kind of like sneak around and write the stories I want to write. Yeah, I feel like, <laughs> sneak around. <laughs> I feel like you're you're a successful food writer. Um, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean I'm very lucky. I'm very very lucky, and um, I appreciate everyone who has let me write for them. And yeah, I was. 
it's very funny to be a food writer, like very, very much a food writer. But then I wrote for the Times last weekend about tattoos at weddings. <laughs> it's like, so for me, like, it's still very much like just kind of eking out a living here and there, like mm -hmm. just, just trying to claw my way through. Um, but yeah, no, but it's, it's very rewarding when it is. And, you know, it's uh, not when it's not. <laughs> so uh, speaking of kind of the topics that you cover. So when you Google Alicia Kennedy, I don't know if you know this, but there are some terms that come up. Oh, I'm, I've been told. <laughs> yes. Um, oysters, one yes. of them. Vegan, yeah. one of them. Cocktails. Oh. One of them. I think these are different than what I get, so that's exciting. Yeah, so... There you go. How do you feel about all those like terms being like connected oh, I, to you? I think that's perfect. I mean, my oyster essay for Hazlitt that I wrote it last year um, was is probably it's definitely the most personal thing I've ever written. But I also think it's the most me thing I've ever written. Um, and it's about my brother's passing and about being vegan and deciding that I was going to eat oysters because it was a way back to my childhood. And I, yeah, it's, it is very much my voice, so I really appreciate that people loved it so much because you don't always get to just write from your gut, you know. Mm. Um, vegan, of course, people associate me with that, and that's fine. I, I love veganism, and, and someone should tell publishers that, and they should <laughs> let me write a book about veganism. <laughs> if um, any publishers are listening, please... Alicia please. Kennedy, yes. vegan, you'll find her. Reach out. <laughs> and cocktails, I mean, yeah, no, I, I drink a lot, so that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's really funny, like, because uh, when I look at my own website, there's, I've recently split it up all by categories, my writing, and the drink section is quite robust. It is just huge. And, like, I've written a lot about lots of things, but clearly I have a, a focal point, and that is cocktails, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the oyster piece. It's gorgeous. Like listeners, you should absolutely Google it and um, and check it out. Um, but the cocktail thing, I wanted to talk to you about because w how would you describe um, cocktail culture and and the the pieces that you take on in cocktail culture? Because they're not like you know, here's the best places to have a Cosmo. They're very specific, like pieces with your like distinct point of view on them um yeah no I I wrote a piece for liquor.com last year that I think people have enjoyed a little bit where I tried to create a distinction between tropical cocktails and tiki cocktails which wasn't an original thought this is from a bar called Jungle Bird that's in San Juan Puerto Rico that's amazing and everyone should go there um but they had a menu that was tropical cocktails and then the other side was tiki cocktails and I'd always been been thinking about like, you know, rum is always in this tiki context and the tiki context is so kitschy. And then is that really all there is to rum? And we, we perpetuate the story, especially in the media, like it's going to be rum's time now. It's not just for tiki. And it's like, well, it wasn't always just for tiki. You know, there's a separate cocktail culture in the Caribbean, especially, and I mean everywhere, but it's indigenous to that space. And so I, I like to uh, draw that distinction and yeah, I've written, and then I recently wrote another piece for liquor.com about how bar owners and bartenders are dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace. And I've written a lot about local Brooklyn artisanal <laughs> booze makers. <laughs> um, cause that's also, you know, a love of mine. I think that we have to consider alcohol as an agricultural product, um, and not just a fun time and think about the sourcing of the products and who's making it and and all that sort of stuff so it's it's fun to write about cocktails from that angle because that is kind of an under under written about uh, portion of of what cocktails are about that's really interesting I think yeah we don't really think about it as something that is a, a product right that comes that is agricultural um I used to work with this bartender who would say, you know, everyone loves the effects of alcohol, but people don't really enjoy like the taste or the background of it. Right. And he wanted to like kind of introduce people to that other side of it. So it sounds like you're kind of, you're thinking about it the same way. Yeah. It's just think it's, it's fun to think about, I think <laughs> is where you're, the things you're putting in your body actually come from. And, you know, we're so concerned with food and, and should be. But um, we should also be concerned with what we're drinking. And I feel like, you know, natural wine is the the rise of that and people being so into natural wine right now is great. And but, you know, we could also think about our gin and our whiskey and, and not just always go for the cheapest thing, though that's also fun sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> <That> is, <yeah. laughs> 
Um, yeah, but, you know, and the, we think about it a lot with agave spirits now, too. Like, I think Mezcal has forced us to think about it. Mm-hmm. But uh, with everything else, I, I feel like it's still going on the back burner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you also grew up in Long Island. I did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to try to tie in a Long Island iced tea tweet that I saw a long time ago. Oh, I mean, I wrote a piece for Munchies called In Defense of the Long Island Iced Tea. Yes. Which was actually goes against everything I just said, <laughs> because um, I believe that a Long Island iced tea should be a bit trashy and it should have its intended effect on you. And uh, the like kicker of that piece is if you fight with your mother, then you know you've had a good Long Island iced tea. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I am, I am from Long Island and uh, I talk about that a lot for some reason. <laughs> oh my goodness. They're, one of my most embarrassing bar stories involves a Long Island iced tea. I think everyone's does. Yeah. Um, I wasn't 21 yet and I had gotten into a bar and I tried it and I was like can I have more tea in this <laughs> and the bartender immediately was like how old are you oh yeah, yeah so. that's a telltale sign yep, yeah yep 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 <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about um you're writing about Long Island Right. Um, I, I would love to write more about Long Island. Um, I was telling you the other day about a piece that I'm trying to sell about Long Island that is, involves murder and beer that for some reason no one will buy. So editors, too, if you want that story, talk to me. Um, but yeah, no, I, I feel like it's a misunderstood place. And I think it, it also ties into a lot of my other writing, which is always like, can we look at a place from outside the perspective that we've always had can can we think about Long Island not as just oh the bros and and like Jersey Shore types and you know maybe you go out east and there's rich people but there's this whole other world in the middle of that and um I just would love for people to just know that and maybe just consider it when you know you People go out to Montauk, and now Montauk is like this gentrified place where it used to not be. And the Hamptons are one thing, and the food's very expensive and not very good. But it's there's also all this whole other world there that isn't isn't exactly what people think. And I, I hope that I can change people's minds about that. So, for listeners who aren't familiar with Long Island, right. um, how would you d- describe it? I mean, it's suburban. It is suburban as hell, you know, and but there are these really great pockets, especially along the north and south shore of towns where, you know, people there are small businesses, there are small restaurants, there are people who are, you know, sourcing their oysters from the dude who, you know, scooped them up that day. Mm. Um, And there's also a lot of great breweries. There's an emerging cocktail scene. Um, and it's, I feel like a lot of people, because, especially because New York is so expensive now in New York city, a lot of people my age, I'm 32, uh, we are deciding to just move home and start the businesses we wish were there when we were younger Mm. and just create the towns that we wish we had grown up in because we grew up in ghost towns basically because of the way malls and everything kind of took away the mom and pop stuff from the main streets. And now it's like, it's all kind of coming back. And I think it's because of people, people my age, just wanting to create the world they wish they grew up in. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. um, My exposure to Long Island is not that great just because I, I'm not from the area and I just moved here like uh, less than two years ago. So Mm -hmm. it beyond the, the Hamptons and, people talking about that every summer it's um it's really interesting to hear about like these like food waste in Long Island and these dishes and these communities and and the like food history of like the the island oh totally and there's a lot there's a great farming culture especially on the North Fork um I used to source when I was cooking or baking everything from one farm in Riverhead and uh, called Golden Earthworm, I believe. Um, Golden but, Earthworm? Yeah, I think. <laughs> wow. And yeah, there's a really great organic farming culture there. Um, I mean, it's. I'm not saying Long Island is by any means a perfect or even good place. I'm just saying <laughs> that it is a more compelling place than people give it credit for. Awesome. Yeah. So speaking of places that you kind of uh, dig into and explore with your writing, you also talk about Puerto Rico yes. a lot. Um when I'm curious, when was uh, the first time you went 
to Puerto Rico? I went to Puerto Rico for the first time in 2009, I believe, and this was on vacation. And uh, I didn't have the experience I wanted to have, um, but I went back for a reporting trip for the first time. I went back a couple of times after that, but then in 2015, I read, I had just started writing about food. I read a story in the New York Times about how the island was entering an agricultural renaissance and it talked to Jose Enrique and it talked to Tara from El Departamento de la Comida. And then there was also a chef in that picture that no one talked to. And for some reason, I just got very obsessed with that <laughs> chef and I followed them on Instagram. Um, their name's Pax and I like talk about them and write about them a lot. Um, and I followed them on Instagram, kept liking all their pictures, got them to agree that I could write about them and then pitched it to Munchies at Vice, and they gave me $150 Ooh. for that piece. Um, <laughs> I flew down with my JetBlue points, again, coming very in handy, and uh, put myself up. I had a full-time job still at the time, and wrote the story. And it was one of the best experiences of, like, my whole life. So, yeah, and then that was it. Like, from there, I just had contacts from that piece from another assignment about pina coladas and then it just snowballed and I just kept writing stories and it felt like there weren't other people writing these stories so it, it yeah and I recently went down in January to write a cover story for barista magazine about a new cafe that opened post Maria um and so people just that story came about because the guy was going to be profiled and he sent me a Facebook message asking if I would write it and that was really kind of reassuring to me. Mm -hmm. And when I was down there, someone else said, oh, he must have asked around for who should write this story. And it was I was just really kind of moved that anyone wanted me to write their cover story, especially because I don't live there. So I always have these like this anxiety about misrepresenting it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was that really confirmed for me that it was OK, I guess. <laughs> so that first chef that you became obsessed with in the picture, can right. you tell listeners a little bit about that chef? Sure. Um, Pax was cooking at El Departamento de la Comida, making like all vegetarian food that was really dope. And it was like way too high end for the price point and to be served in like an unair conditioned former <laughs> garage. Like it was just really crazy. And that's why it was a good story, especially for munchies. Um, but now they already they had their own place called El Bauricua, where they made bao buns filled with like Puerto Rican flavors mm. and that was really great but after Maria they had to close that and now they're cooking at Jungle Bird the bar I talked about before in the kitchen there a few days a week and doing these amazing like these dishes are just so amazing again it's like a weird setting for such good food and that's what I think I love about them and what they do is that just they serve this amazing food in a setting where you totally wouldn't expect it and at a price point that's totally like doable I mean not, especially for me coming from New York so like ba almost nothing is over ten dollars and you're getting these gorgeous like handmade dumplings filled mm -hmm. with tofu and vegetables or like a bao bun filled with fried eggplant and zucchini flowers and just and using lots and lots of local produce and and they've always done that because basically that's the way to support agriculture on the island um, and uh, yeah, I'm still obsessed with Pax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so listeners should check Pax out. Oh yeah, Paxito Absolutely. on on Instagram, I think. Paxito. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to an interview that you did where you were talking about how no one will let you write that Puerto Rico is a colony. Right now they do a little bit. It's, okay. It's a post Maria thing. Now we're allowed to say that Puerto Rico is a colony mm -hmm. a little bit, but with still within uh, some parameters. I'm so sure someone would change it to territory. Mm -hmm. But um, why do you think that is? I mean, I know I think that is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's because, you know, uh, in the U.S., it's very difficult to reckon with the imperialist agenda of our nation and the havoc it wreaks on other people, usually in the global south. And uh, no one wants to deal with that. And to call it a colony would be to recognize that, that we have a white supremacist imperialist agenda in the globe, and it manifests quite clearly in Puerto Rico. Um, as you know, we've seen they've been in an economic crisis for years now, and we've seen how They've been left in the lurch after Maria. And uh, yeah. And so, to yeah, even on a scale where it's just a food piece, no one would like to 
think of themselves that way and their culpability in, in U.S. politics. Mm-hmm. Would, you, would you like to see more uh, food media platforms ad- address that through food writing or use the terminology? Or do you think food media is capable of handling that yet? I, I wish it were. I think. I mean, we have these great conversations on Twitter, I think, sometimes about word choices and, and how they create our reality. And the, I mean, we, there was recently a New Yorker review about a Mexican restaurant in Gowanus that used the term elevated in the headline, elevated mole. Mm. Um, and it's a white chef, of course. And I would love to see people and editors have a little bit more concern for the way that their word choices can impact how people perceive a cuisine. Because if you're, if you're trying to say, oh, look at the good mole, um, I don't know, there's a way to say that that doesn't denigrate everything else, that doesn't right. make it so there's the cheap bad mole and the good expensive mole. And mm. it's just, these are just conversations that I wish people were actually having, that they don't, we seem to have them amongst ourselves, but they don't seem to... Mm, filter upwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a question I always love to ask food writers, um, is what does the ideal food media landscape look like to you? Oh boy. Um, (laughs) I think the food writers workshop kind of portrayed that for me. I think it, it was open to everyone who could afford a $15 ticket. It was reflective of the diversity that I see. And I mean, it could have even been better on all ends of that spectrum. It could have been cheaper. It could have been more diverse. It could have, uh, there's lots of things we can do in the future to make that better. Um, But it also gave a lot of space to independent media. We had a whole panel on creating your own magazine and I would just love more of that. I would just love less corporate kind of influence and more people doing it for themselves. I mean, that's difficult to say because we all have to make a living. Um, but at the same time, those people that we put up there, like from Jari Mag, from Whetstone, from Put an Egg on It, from Counter Service, and we had Paige Lapari who owns the amazing Greenpoint cookbook, cookbook store, Archistratus. Um, these are all people who, it might not be their, their most substantial source of income, but mm-hmm. they're just creating what they want to see and I think we all should just be more empowered to create the food media we want to see they're making it happen yes that panel was awesome yes um especially because they talked about the like very real challenges of creating a food magazine yes. on a shoestring budget oh totally I love I mean the whole day was great because I think for whatever reason something about our personalities got in there and people were just like let's just be real about yeah. this <laughs> like yeah it was very real <laughs> everyone kept it real yes <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more of Alicia Kennedy. Patina Restaurant Group offers unparalleled service in New York's most iconic locations, including Lincoln Center, Rockefeller Center, and Macy's Herald Square. From meetings and presentations in the glass-walled atrium to galas in the renovated Palm House and intimate wedding showers at Yellow Magnolia Cafe, your event will be perfectly imagined and customized at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. You can also enjoy a la carte brunch and lunch at the picturesque Yellow Magnolia Cafe overlooking Lily Pool Terrace. Chef Rob Newton and chef de cuisine Morgan Jarrett offer warm, distinctive cuisine with a focus on local vegetables, grains, and sustainably sourced meats and fish. All right, so we're back with A Hungry Society and Alicia Kennedy. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about growing up. Um, Did your family have any, like, dining traditions? Like, at home, we had the yelling at each other tradition. (laughs) Um, When we went out, everyone was better behaved. And uh, we went to a Japanese restaurant in my hometown of Patchogue that does it. It's like Rite Aid now, um, which is so sad. But it was called Heisei. And that was where I learned how to use chopsticks. And I I always ate like shrimp, like tempura, like a jerk. But uh, we always went there like every week. And it was 
I miss that a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At home, it was the yelling at one another. You said yes. <laughs> <laughs> like over dinner, while making dinner, uh, well, after dinner. Uh, you know, it, it, the during. It was always nice. You know, it was. You know, it, <laughs> I come from a very boisterous family. Yes. <laughs> Um, with, yeah, but that's more of a discussion for therapy, I think, than for the radio. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, were there any other like, um, outside dining places that you guys went in Long Island? Oh yeah. We, um, yeah, we ate a lot, ate out a lot. I feel like a lot of people talk about not eating out a lot when they were kids, but for me, that's totally not the case. Like there were always the places we went on the water to eat clams oysters I would always eat fried clam strips like anything fried was is very much for me so I've there's that continuity in my life (laughs) um there were you know all the Italian restaurants that sort of thing like I love a red sauce joint um but I I feel like everywhere in my hometown that I liked that I was like oh it's this is really good this is great it always closed within like six months because there was a great bakery with the first place I had chocolate ganache it closed. And then there was a really great Italian restaurant called Manja Manja. And like the sauce was so like fresh and vibrant. It and was then, called Manja Manja. Yes, of course it was. Wow. <laughs> it, I swear <laughs> to God that like that was just a ploy. Like the, 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 they still own the best pizzeria in Pacha called Del Fiore. Del Fiore. Um, but yeah, no, I, everything closed all the time. But I, th- I think people are getting better at liking good food now. So that's mm. nice. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> what What did you order at the red sauce joints? What was your go-to? Oh, gosh. Basically, chicken parmesan. I mean, okay. which I sounds... was going to ask if it was in the parmesan family. Oh, of course. Because that's such a New York area thing, oh, I've noticed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there's the parmesan section, like, of a menu. Yes. With, like, eggplant, chicken, uh, veal. Yes. Um, without m- occasionally meatballs. Occasionally, yeah. Yeah. And it's just covered in mozzarella. It's just sauce and cheese. Yes. Yeah. And it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you point to like a memorable like restaurant experience that you've had? Sure. Yeah. I um well every time this comes up I always say, Oh, the time me and my friend went to Chicago for one day to eat at Alinea. And then I went and I thought I was, I, I was a little funny slash a little, this was all I had to wear was in a vintage like floral express dress that was skin tight and Doc Martens. Cause I, <laughs> well, cause we were going there for a day. So I didn't want to pack that much. So I like wore this like very grunge riot girl outfit to Alinea and I was so excited about it. And the meal was amazing, but I always say, like, this is where I learned the the very big difference between rich people and people who like food, because it was just such a weird experience in that way. But um, my best dining experience, I think, was I ate alone at 1919 in San Juan, and the chef, Juan Jose Cuevas, who's a brilliant, very sweet man, um, just made me this vegan tasting menu, mm. and I was like, Ugh, what what are they going to serve me? It's going to be terrible. But then I was like just looking out on the ocean with a glass of like a wine pairing and just dish after dish of like brilliant farm to table food that was just perfectly beautifully seasoned. And he like came from Blue Hill, so he knew what he was doing. Um, And that I think was definitely the best meal I've ever had. Wow. Yeah. That sounds incredible. Yeah. And it was Um, alone. Let's back (laughs) it up to the Alinea experience. How old were you? I wasn't that young. I was like, well, I think I was 27, 28. So this was, how, how did this trip come about? Like, I'm so curious about this. (laughs) Well, me and my friend are big nerds. So like my (laughs) friend, Justin, he loves Dave Arnold. Like he cooks sous vide all the time. He is just a huge nerd. And I, I mean, I'm a huge nerd. I love to cook, but I'm also more a nerd about the, the culture around everything. So I definitely like wanted to know what it was like to eat at Alinea. And I knew that they would do a vegan tasting menu because I had read someone else had one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, and I'd, I'd never had a three. I'd never had any Michelin star dining thing. So we, I was like, let's just we're going to do it. And uh, we we booked the tickets for the for the dinner. And it was three hundred dollars. So it's expensive. But yeah. like when you think about like the fact that we'll talk about it forever. Um, it's okay. Sort of. Um, (laughs) I mean, I have a very money is like water relationship, you know, it comes and goes, but, um, yeah. So then that was, it was a really amazing experience. You know, they brought us the balloon. The best thing of course was that dessert 
we got the one where they do it on the table and it's all the tropical fruits and the everything. So they on. like on your the table that you're eating on. Well, they put yeah, they put like a, a thingy down that's like plastic. So oh, that okay. it's it's like a tarp, but it's it fits the table <laughs> perfectly. A fancy of course, tarp. it's a fancy tarp. Right. Um, and then they lay, you know, it's like the passion fruit and there's some rum and there's coconut. It's like all the things I love because I love tropical flavors. Um, and it was just. Uh, Incredible. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think we could have eaten again after we left. It's that kind of thing. Right. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was an an incredible experience and also made me feel extremely weird about fine dining and ever spending that much money on a meal again. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. What's one of your best cocktail experiences? Always La Factoria in San Juan. Yes. Yes. We've talked about La Factoria in San Juan before. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, I'll let you describe La Factoria. <laughs> uh, so it's technically a speakeasy, but not really. Like, there's just no sign. And then you go in, and it, you feel like you could be in Brooklyn. Like, the walls look like this in Roberta's, and there's string lights and everything. But it's just another experience. You just walk in there, and it, it's like some sort of energy portal to some world where, like, the outside does no no longer exist. The last time I was there was for their fifth anniversary last month, and Louis Guzman just walked into a room. And it was, like, this magical, like, slow motion moment. <laughs> We're just being like, why is this famous guy here? Um, and, yeah, it's just – it's always – I always say it's always too, too many drinks that you're, that I'm, at least me, is being served. And, but you just sit there and have these really, I don't, usually it's a really funny conversation with a stranger. Yes. I'll usually, and it's, you make friends. Like I still follow people on Instagram that I've met there sitting at the bar. And it's just one of those places where you, you just get sucked in to, and, and I think that's the best thing a bar can do is just take you somewhere else for a little while and, and make you forget absolutely everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if any listeners ever find themselves in San Juan, please check out La Factoria. Yes. There is um, the bar up front. Yes. And then there's a wine bar behind that. And then there is the a dancing bar. A dancing bar behind that <laughs> with salsa. Yeah. And then in a room attached to that is like techno club music. Right. Yes. With a bar. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's bars in every room. In every single room. It's a just magical maze of alcohol. Yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and, you know, whatever kind of bar you want, they've got it. Absolutely. And I think the last time I went, I it was uh, me and my now husband, we were there and... I think we went in at like 11 p.m. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what time we came out. It, it might have been like four in the morning. Yes. I, I don't think I've ever left there before four in the morning. <laughs> so we've talked about your favorites. Uh, yes. What's one of the worst stunning experiences you've ever had? Oh, boy. I'm ready to talk about this. Um, so <laughs> I and I'm, I'm willing to name names because, you know, um, so ABCV in New York uh, is a vegan I think it's completely vegan. It might just be vegetarian, but I have had the worst service experiences ever there. And like I was reviewing it for The Voice once and I went on my second visit for dinner without a reservation just to kind of see how do you get retreated here without Mm -hmm. a reservation? And the answer was quite poorly. (laughs) Um, uh, They put us in the back all the way in the corner, um, told us that we'd only have a certain amount of time before we'd have to leave because the table would need to go to someone else, which, like, I understand that, but the way they did it was just very, like, you shouldn't even be here. Ooh. And then they forgot a dosa we ordered, and then when we pointed it out, they were like, oh, do you still want it? <laughs> and then I was there again a few weeks ago, because I was like, let me give them another chance, and let me give them another chance while someone else is putting this on their company card. <laughs> right. Um, they ask you to order, like, two to three dishes per person, and we were like, oh, that seems a bit excessive for lunch right now. Like, we're going to order this much right now. We'll see how we feel. They ask, well, what do you think you might order? And we said, oh, this salad we were looking at. And then all of a sudden, the salad's the first thing out. And then we get all the rest of the food. And then they made a mistake on one of the things we ordered. But it was still like that. It, it just always seems like your fault mm. for their mistake. And <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm willing to be so boldly angry at this restaurant because I also feel like it makes such a terrible mockery of veganism (laughs) because it's like, you know, there's like the Hindu gods, which is the whole restaurant's aesthetic because it's ABC carpet and home. But it just, 
it's just the worst instincts of veganism on display there, which is just expensive, not that filling, like mostly to be seen. You drink a vibrational juice. It's just a all, vibrational. Oh juice? yeah, it's like vibrational tonics. I think they're called. What's and, the difference between the normal juice and the vibrational juice? <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I don't know. So really. It's just all these terrible instincts about veganism, and, and it really makes me upset. Uh, but the food was a lot better the last time I went. I will say that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'm willing, you know, just don't don't force food on people. It's very strange. Did they, Wait, did they charge you guys for the salad? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. And it wasn't char- just like, oh, here you go. You guys no, are no, thinking no, no, about no. it, so try it. No. It was, oh, wow. they charged us for the salad. They charged us for the dosa that they forgot, and then, like, we had to ask for again. Oh, my goodness. But it was really funny, because that time with the dosa, next to us was, a, like, a girl and a boyfriend and she was going to interview the chef for something and they were treating them so well. Uh, and it was just such a f- hilarious contrast to me because it's like I was there to write a review but no one knew that. And then this girl is doing an interview and getting all these plates of free food and everything and the mm. chef's coming out to greet her and everything. And it's just like, this is perfect. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are at the last question. Cool. <laughs> if you could have your last meal in a restaurant... Where would it be and who was invited? I would have my last meal. These days, I've been going to this new oyster bar in my hometown called pa- um, Catch Oyster Bar a lot. Okay. Um, and me and my mom go there like every weekend and have martinis and oysters and po' boys. And I think that would definitely be my last meal right now. Uh, a martini, some oysters, po' boys, french fries. And I would have just my whole extended family there. Plus my boyfriend, Serene. <laughs> yeah shout out to serene yes if she's listening um yeah so that would just that or would you have like other stuff come in it could be from like food from anywhere uh, you know i i think that would be pretty solid i'd be pretty full mm. pretty drunk that's good yeah <laughs> <laughs> well alicia thank you so much for coming oh thank you for having me um i i love chatting with you as always oh and you were gonna announce um Right. project you're working on. Yeah, so I'm launching a podcast called Meatless on June 5th. Um, the first interview is with Brooks Headley about his new cookbook, The Superiority Burger Cookbook. And it is going to be a show about the intersection of veganism and vegetarianism with everything else, culture, economy, agriculture, all that. Just try and figure out whether we should eat meat or not. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, you are welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for coming. And thank you for listening to A Hungry Society. We will catch you next week. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please... Join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts 
get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.